Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Mike and I have been looking forward to this for a few weeks. We've been talking about it. We, uh, we have an interesting format that I'm hoping will be enjoyable where we're going to transition into reporters. I've always wanted to work for the Daily Mail. This is going to be one of my first chances to ask some questions, and Mike's going to ask me some questions, and we're going to try to hopefully talk a little bit about the streaming business and distribution internationally. So we'll have a little fun. So with that, why don't you introduce your presentation? Sure, though. yes. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, we've got a short clip to show you a little <coughs> bit about what we've been up to. It's been several years since Hulu has been represented here at MIP, and uh, this gives you a little taste of what we've been up to. If I got the feeling... Okay, ready, hey, oh, here we go! Okay, let's go! Yo! Yeah! yeah. Come on, go, go, go! Oh, yes. Should we get started? You wanna do this? Let's go. If I got the feeling... It's a little difficult going after that, but I'll introduce our Lionsgate presentation. Um, luckily, there were a few of our movies up there, which is always nice to and, see. And and some some, original, our, shows. some original shows. Uh, we're going to show the Lionsgate reel right now, and you'll see three shows that we actually do in conjunction with Mike. Casual, which uh, Jason Reitman, who directed Juno, who's executive producing, premieres actually in a week or so, October 7th. Uh, Rocket Jump the Show, which is uh, Freddie Wong, who's somebody that we've been partners with at Lionsgate for a while, and we have a number of shows with him. He's doing Rocket Jump the Show, and he did Video Game High School in the U.S., and very successfully, and that's coming out in December. And then the last one, uh, Deadbeat, which was our first show together, and that's premiering. Season two has already premiered, and that is uh, one of the first shows I think you did uh, as an original script, and we're very proud of that. So with that, we'll show a reel. Lionsgate is defining entertainment as one of the three fastest growing entertainment companies in the world. This is amazing. Pioneering original digital content for brands like Hulu and Netflix. What's wrong with you? Um, lots of things. Lionsgate partnered with Hulu on their first original scripted series, Deadbeat. You talk to ghosts? I'm a medium. And continues to grow its partnership with two new digital series this year, bringing YouTube sensation Freddie Wong, whose content amassed over 1.2 billion views to date, to mainstream television with Rocket Jump, the show, and ushering in Academy Award-nominated director Jason Reitman's critically acclaimed television debut, Casual. You use your own dating site. Bingo. Are you his date? Yeah. Okay, that's his sister. And they were shit-talking us back here. In addition to producing Netflix's most watched show ever, Orange is the New Black, which catapulted them into the original space. This is just great! With 30 shows on 20 different networks to date, six Golden Globes, 29 Emmys, and over 200 nominations with distribution partners in more than 275 territories and over 2,000 clients. Lionsgate is a leading supplier of premium scripted content to broadcast, cable, and digital platforms around the world. It's amazing. That's what I'm talking about. That is so kind. Lionsgate, defining entertainment. 
Very okay. nice. Touche. We have our two tapes. <laughs> That's great. So, Mike, I want to ask you, about six or seven years ago, I got a call from a Netflix executive who came over and said, uh, we want to start this streaming service. We want to talk to you about licensing content. And they came over, and we had a meeting, and the first thing they said was, Jim, we'd like to license everything you can't sell. And I, as a distribution executive, I smiled and said, really, you want to license everything we can't sell? Yes, that's what we want to do. And from that moment till now, there's been a huge transformation. And Netflix, Amazon, Hulu have all spent hundreds of millions of dollars on original brand-defining content. And we've seen a big change in the marketplace versus that first meeting I had with Netflix. So talk a little bit about how important that is, why there's so much money being spent, and, and how you see that progressing in the future. Sure. Sure, thank you for that. And it's nice to be here outside of a dark conference room negotiating <laughs> exactly. programming agreements um, with you. Um, so, you know, there's been so much change in, in streaming and television. Think about it, maybe the sharing economy is the, is the other place where there's so much change uh, disrupting markets that streaming is doing for TV. Um, you know, when you look at consumer behavior and, and, and patterns of viewership, it's all changing so dramatically. When you look at the number of devices that are being adopted, particularly in the living room, uh, and all the different competitors that are, that are emerging. In fact, the last presentation, we learned about two new SVOD services yeah. launching. And so there's an array of choice. And so for us, when we look at the, the overall content portfolio that we have to have, original programming is very important. Uh, if you go look back over the history of TV, particularly over the last 15 or 20 years, you can find defining shows that really set up brands in the U.S. at least for television networks. If you look at The Shield at FX, if you look at Sopranos at HBO, um, South Park with Comedy Central, Mad Men with, uh, with AMC, and you can go on with a few others of like that, um, those shows change those brands, change the tra trajectory of those brands and really are now relevant to them. And of course, you got to follow up with additional hits. And so for us, we're looking for that show. And we think we've got a couple that, and hopefully uh, one of the ones yep, from you will, be, will do that trick for us. Um, but that's not enough for us. We have, you know, a couple of shows won't, won't make a big subscription service, we don't think. So that's why we've been so aggressive over the last couple of years, acquiring films, acquiring iconic shows like Seinfeld and CSI and South Park. Uh, and acquiring a, an array of prior seasons of big hits. We, we licensed Empire and Last Man on Earth uh, most recently, um, and big output deals with FXP and AMC and Turner, and um, we're gonna announce another big one tomorrow. I wish it was done and we could announce it here today, but, uh, but we've, we're acquiring a lot of new content to try to really create a diverse set of, of, of offerings for customers. Great. So, so Jim, so Jim. Yes, exactly. Yes, Mike. <laughs> You know, Lionsgate's often talked about as the Switzerland of, of programmers in the world. And, and when you look at, uh, and it's nice to say that here in yeah, Europe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, as you look around the, the globe, all these different technological changes and the market's changing, how are you now approaching the market? Well, I mean, uh, to use the Switzerland, we, we don't like people fighting, but we do like winners. And we try to go into every country and find a winner. Uh, but I do think the number one thing we have to do now is be flexible and be open to change. And I think that change for us really means challenging what we think is a traditional window. Um, every, every time we look at a country, we have to say to ourselves, what's the right way to do things? I think with Orange is the New Black, we had a moment in time where we were delaying everything uh, in China, for example, six months. And what we found was the piracy was just killing us. And because Netflix was doing 13 episodes at once, we decided let's just change our windowing strategy and do all 13 at once. And we did that and not only did we quadruple the revenue we were getting out of China because, the broad, you know, because our platform, in that situation it was a, a VOD platform, could get it right away, um, but it also really helped us against piracy because it was available legitimately. So things like that, uh, hot from the US, is a strategy that you know, early on when I thought about putting something up for EST before it got a linear sale and, and my team came to me and, and discussed that, I was a little suspect, you know, why do we want to do that? And, and the argument was, well, if it catches on and does well, you're going to, you know, have another place to put it. And sure enough, we did that for a couple shows and it worked. So I think for us, we have to go into it and really be open-minded to changing the way we think about what's a traditional window. Right. And that's kind of how we're doing it. Interesting. Yeah. So um, let's talk about international. We're here in France, it's a little wet, a little rainy, but we're here. Let's talk a about your platform. I went on there and I noticed a lot of international programming. Uh, I saw Korean drama, some British, some Latin American product. And 
obviously that's an area that you've put some emphasis in. So let's talk a little bit about that. And then the question I'm sure everybody would love to ask, which is, you know, how do you view the international streaming market? Is this a market you want to attack at some point? And what do you think of the competition? Sure. You know, well, Hulu's had a long tradition of bringing, inter, you know, foreign language and international programming into the United States. Um, and we look at it in two, two, two ways. Uh, first, are there uh, expat populations in the U.S. that we can aggregate enough content in and, and, and satisfy the demand that emerges from that from that market. Um, you know, a couple of examples of those are Spanish language. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a really powerful offering there, mostly targeting Mexican Americans, and so we've got to deal with Univision, and we've got things uh, packed around that. Um, the, second, the second area we look at are, are there shows or films that individually, um, or as a collection, can cross over and break through into the general market, whether that's in language or not. Um, and so we do try to target those and try to figure out, you know, based on our demos, based on, on the viewers we have, do we think that some shows or movies can cross over? Um, examples of those are Korean dramas, actually. Uh, while we have them aggregated, we do see that it's not just expats from Korea yeah. watching those, those shows. They're so well done and they're, they're popcorn and they're definitely um, tell, almost like telenovelas, if yeah, you will. Yeah. Um, and they cross over into the general market for us, and so we've been really happy with that programming. And so we're, we're here, and the team's here today and this week to, to really try to find out if we can tap into e either of those two opportunities. Um, and then in terms of the, the second question, um, I really have no comment. Oh, I'm just kidding. Um, exactly like a TMZ <laughs> interview, exactly. I'm just kidding. Um, you know, we're, we're evaluating the markets. Um, we don't have any, any plans at the moment to expand internationally, but uh, it's clearly a growing market, as I said before. When you look at the adoption, when you look at, at, at broadband penetrations, when you look at these, this array of devices that is being adopted in every market around right. the country, around the world, uh, it's definitely compelling and something that I think we'll take a look at. Okay, great. Great. So um, speaking of technological change, so you've got you know, all of these new types of buyers all over the planet, uh, multiple SVOD competitors along with pay TV, cable, over the air. Um, how has the technological changes impacted sort of how your windowing strategy is going forward and your deal structures? Well, I, I think it's gotten incredibly complicated. I, I, I kind of long for the days we had four rights, you know, free, basic, pay, and a little bit of on demand. And now I think our rights team is tracking 15 different rights. So yeah. just from a, you know, attacking the US and attacking the globe in kind of a rights management situation, it's very complicated. Uh, I think in the UK, we've windowed Mad Men f five different times to five different partners. So we have to be very, very smart about how we window and who we, who we talk to and who goes first and who's go who goes second. I mean, if you look at the SVOD rights profile, it's very different than traditional. I mean, everybody in the traditional thing would have a window up for a couple of years, they would take it down, whereas SVOD needs it up all the time. People can sample as they go, they get into a show, they want to watch them all, so having all of the episodes available on an SVOD platform all the time really presents us with challenges, mm -hmm. especially when they want to go first. And one of the things we're seeing internationally is we have a lot of our SVOD partners that want to go before free or before basic, they want to go first. So that is kind of the number one challenge to figure that out. We, we also look at the market a little bit different. We don't have output deals. Um, we have a lot of great, big, bold shows. They're eclectic. They don't all fit for one partner. Mm -hmm. Some of my competition has output deals where they put everything through with one partner. We don't do that. And it's really helped us attract better showrunners, you know, to get the kinds mm -hmm. of shows done that we're doing for sure. you and for others. Uh, it also, it really gives us an opportunity to have great third-party partners. One of our partners I'm actually going to make an announcement about today, which is Skydance International, who we do Manhattan with, mm -hmm. which, which happens have, to be yeah. on your platform. And we are going to announce today a global distribution pact with Skydance International, where Lionsgate is going to represent all forms, of all forms of distribution for Skydance International for the next couple of years. And, and it really has to do with the fact that we got to know them and they got to know us. They had lots of choices. And I think they like the fact that they're big and bold with Mission Impossible and Terminator on the film side. They want somebody that can go to the marketplace and attack in a, in a smart, uh, but individualistic way, and that's what we're going to do. So that's kind of our next uh, big announcement that's going to come out. That's great. Congratulations. Thank you. We're very excited about that. So the last thing, uh, well, next thing I want to talk about is a little bit about a topic that, that I read a lot about on the way over here, and we can both talk about it a little bit, which is kind of 
the platinum age of TV. So it's gone, gone from the golden age of TV to the platinum age of TV. And then you read John Langraff saying there's way too much of it. So where do you sit on the volume of great content that's out there? You know, do you have aspirations like Netflix to have 40, you know, a lot of programming? Do you, wh what's the sweet spot? And, um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how I see it on a competitive basis. Sure. Well, look, I think that, um, that it is. There's a lot of great yeah. shows out there and, and, and more, more than have ever been available. And I think that actually lends itself to services like ours, These, you know, an SVOD service where uh, we find when we have this big library of prior seasons and iconic shows that somebody may find a show that they, they had heard about five years ago and it may be in its fifth year and if we have it, they'll start at episode one and binge all the way to current. Um, and it's new to them, you know, even though it's a show that's been on TV for five or six years. Look at Seinfeld. We licensed Seinfeld over the summer and it's emerged to be one of our top shows and that's a show that's been off the air since yeah, a long, a long time. time. Um, and so, you know, I think having this ability to stack up all of these shows season after season and then find a way to be personalized with the service to really target customers with shows that they maybe weren't sure that they would like really lends itself uh, to an SVOD service as opposed to a network business that tends to, you know, have it for a season and it goes to another platform. And so we love the fact that we're in sort of this heyday or platinum age of, of TV. Um, but for us, when we also, we talked about originals before, I don't think you'll see us try to do 30 or 40 original shows per year because there that's are so lot. many that's, out that's there. That's hard to actually um, get that done. And so our strategy is going to be to take big shots um, with, with iconic uh, showrunners and, and creators and then really market them aggressively to try to take fewer shots but make them bigger uh, and try to punch through with, it, with that strategy. Yeah, I think, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with Kevin Beggs, who's chairman of our TV group, and, and Chris Selleck and, and Sandra. They have a group that's really focused on getting high quality. We, we have, a, I think, a sweet spot of volume. Um, we don't need filler shows anymore. I think when you look at the marketplace, I think five to seven years ago, we would have said, you know, we need some stuff because there was so much demand internationally that we could have a filler show. Mm -hmm. I think with the quality and the, and the volume that's out in the competitive marketplace right now, we want things that can actually break through and actually make a difference for a, a particular partner. Um, that's what really makes a difference, and that's what we need to do. The other thing I... I think we've started to do is really open up our thinking on making sure we're on every single platform. You know, you never know where somebody's going to discover something. I think, again, I'll use Orange is the New Black as an interesting thing because we, we didn't have high aspirations for that show on DVD because we just didn't mm -hmm. think it would work. And Ron Schwartz, who runs our group, and I, he and I thought maybe it would do a little bit, but not much. It came out and was one of our best sellers of the year. Mm -hmm. So what you realize is you have to have that content wherever people are going to start their sampling. So if they're going to start it with a DVD in Walmart or Target, then you need to be there. And I think that's one of the things that competition and a lot of content out there has really forced us to do is make sure we're on you know, every single platform. Yeah, and you mentioned filler shows, and I think that's, that's actually a, a really interesting topic because I, I feel like you either have to have a really good quality show or you shouldn't make it, and yeah. the market's going to tell you it's going to go away, right? Yeah, because, that's right. because of this technological revolution where virtually every show is available to somebody in some format whether it's SVOD or EST or DVD, people don't have to settle as yeah. a consumer. As a yeah. consumer, you don't have to settle for that show that's programmed at that particular time um, just because that's all that's on. Right. And, and I think that's also leading to this increase in quality because the bar is getting higher and higher every day um, because it is so competitive. For and you have a lot of stuff. film talent that's getting into the TV space. I think that the, the quality of talent, whether it's in front of the camera or behind the camera, that's wanting to get into television, is probably at the height that's ever been. And I think that you know, shorter seasons, more creative flexibility on the production side, all that has contributed to, I think, a really good mix. Yeah. You know? um, cord fraying, cord cutting, everybody talks about it a little bit. Then you look at the ad market, which is still, there's you know, still billions of dollars of ad money out there trying to, to compete. How do you view the changing dynamic right now? You're in both spaces, so you're in the ad space and you're in the subscriptions subscription space, so what do you think about the two and how they're going to change or, or you know, coexist over the next couple of years? Sure. Well, you know, we've recently announced a, and launched a commercial free plan to go along with our limited commercials plan in our subscription world, and um, we did that for a couple of reasons. One, we thought that, uh, well, our research told us that there were a lot of consumers that just wouldn't buy Hulu uh, if it had ads. 
Um, we also found that it was the number one reason people churned and canceled their subscription was the existence of advertising. Um, and so we launched the plan, and, and, uh, w but it was no means of, uh, for us to get out of advertising. In fact, Is it we, hard to message three plans? Well, you know, we really, really only message two. So we have a, a free streaming layer, which is basically available on a PC only. It's a limited amount of content. We look at that as an upsell mechanism to one of the two subscription plans. Um, but what we found is the vast majority of our customers are choosing the, the ad-supported subscription package versus the no commercials plan, which has been great because mm. we've all simultaneously invested in, in programmatic advertising to really target advertising much more effectively to consumers. And so we're making that ad experience so much better on the limited commercials plan that consumers are actually opting to take that plan over paying more for no commercials. Mm. Um, and we really see the advertising in and of itself as a strategic advantage to us because our ARPU ends up being a lot higher than a lot of our competitors because of the advertising. And so we're really, really optimistic about that future. Hmm, that's great. Well, when I think about um, the ad space, we're moving a lot of content into AVOD because we want to take advantage of that spot mm -hmm. and, and want to take advantage of, we do think some of that money's going to transition. The, 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 we're using different metrics now in, in how we sell things and, and we're using things like, you know, Word of mouth, we have indexes where we can get word of mouth on shows. You know, we don't get as much data from sure. those of you in the SVOD space, so we have to create data for mm -hmm. ourselves to use internationally. So we're, we're creating ways to not only convince international broadcasters that our shows will rate and they can get the ad dollars, um, we're also really focused on cast now. It's interesting, we're, we're really a lot more focused on who's in the show because mm -hmm. that really helps us get through the clutter. And then the last thing I think has changed uh, in a pretty big way, which is, being able to go day and date internationally. Mm -hmm. That's another thing for us that's become a, kind of a data point that we really look at. If we can produce a show so that we can deliver it in time with either dubs or subtitles so that an international partner can go at the same time our US partner goes, um, that really helps us internationally. And so right. that's actually affecting how we produce shows, how we sell shows, and what we look at as far as uh, our metrics. And so it's kind of well, interesting. What kind of metrics do you, do you find are the most valuable? From, as you, you get, you're getting, I assume, a lot of metrics from your It's not as, I mean, it's ratings, it still is ratings, but a lot of times we don't have ratings, so we have mm -hmm. to come up with different ways. Uh, I'll use, for example, Orange is the New Black, our DVD sales. I mean, because we're out selling the back mm -hmm. end of Orange is, the New Bla Orange is the New Black right now. And because we don't get metrics off of Netflix, we're using other data points. Mm -hmm. um, we're using Twitter feeds. And we're using so many different pieces now, and we pull them together um, and, and use as much of that as we can because it's... Um, you know, you have to be scrappy if you don't get the data. Mm -hmm. It still matters if you get good ratings, but plus seven matters now more than ever. I just saw Nashville, which is our, uh, you know, one of our new shows, that, or not one of our new shows, but it has a new season, and our plus seven was up something like 40%. Yeah. I mean, that's a major change for us, and so we won't go out with day one. We'll wait a little bit and, and make sure we use the right kind of stuff. So that's kind of the, the next... Yeah, the I think thing. plus seven is probably not the right metric going forward either. I mean, you think of Nashville by way of example. We have Nashville, we, we have it in the library, and we have the current season through our ABC relationship. And you can see people watching Nashville three weeks, a month after the, yeah. the episode aired. So it's My almost like you want to see a, a, a measurement over the course of a season yeah. or over the course of a year, and, and, and those impressions and, and views pile up over time. Yeah, so let's just talk a little bit about bundles and what we see, and obviously we can talk a little bit about international and mm -hmm. domestic. You know, I think there's more written about stuff than that, than's actually happening, quite frankly, right sure. now, but it is starting to change, and you know, with, with Disney's announcement of what was going on with ESPN, mm -hmm. there's definitely been some changes. So what do you see over the next couple of years as far as the bundle, and, and if you can think about it in the U.S. and then internationally? Sure. Well, sure. I mean, the U.S. is, as you know, a pretty unique marketplace where you've got um, what, 80, 90 percent, 90 percent penetration of the big bundle, you know, that can cost anywhere from 60 to 80 dollars a month per, per home. And th as has been reported, there seems to be some fraying of the bundle a little bit in the U.S. Um, most of the, you know, the broadcast content is easily available with an antenna over the air, and now you've got customers that are starting to look around for other mm -hmm. alternatives online, whether it be Netflix or Amazon or Hulu, uh, and, other, and other options. Um, but we still, I still think that the broad, you know, the multi-channel bundle in the U.S. is going to continue to thrive and be a, a meaningful business for many, many years to come, although it's going to have some stress on it. But I think what consumers are starting to realize is there is another option, that you can add to that bundle 
via over the top, and we see most of our customers adding to the bundle, not switching off of it and coming directly as cord cutters. But, but because of that, I think that's why shaving is maybe a bigger issue. Yeah. Um, you see HBO and Showtime going over the top, and so now as a cable customer, you, you don't have to buy it from your MVPD. You can go and purchase it through, uh, in the case of Showtime, you can purchase it through us, or you can purchase both of those products through iTunes or, or another, another offering. And so I think there's definitely this choice and this technological um, revolution, really, I think is going to put pressure on all those kinds of businesses, certainly in the U.S. Yeah, I, th I think it's, you know, I hope, and I think we're making a couple plays, that it's going to be slight shaving where you, somebody might have a bundle for 80 and they yeah. go down to 70, and then they buy Hulu, they buy Netflix, and we're starting a couple of SVOD services ourselves yeah. with Comic-Con and with Tribeca Shortlist. So we think some of these very targeted, branded services, if they're priced appropriately, yep. um, someone can still get all the value out of the bundle, mm -hmm. but if you happen to be a Comic-Con fan and you, you know, that's something that sure. you're into, you can really add that on, and so you may, at the end of the day, still be taking $80 out of the ecosystem, maybe even more, but you'll have a, a service that's a little bit more tailored to your own needs and your own, your own likes, and I think that will be good for the business long term. I do. I think that base MVPD package in the U.S. is solid. I think it's the add-ons around it, whether it be you know those types of niche packages or the fill screen ones we heard about. Exactly. There's there's going to be a lot of options for people to add on that two, three, four dollar uh, option on top of their bundle, uh, and they just they just may not do it through the MVPD. Exactly. All right. Well, I have one minute left. I'm going off script. Okay. So uh -oh. let's talk about movies. Yes. So you just made a big commitment to Epix. Mm -hmm. uh, it was exciting to see it up there on the screen. Uh, talk a little bit about. You have, you, you have originals, you have acquired, and now you have a, a big film library. Talk yes. about how that works and uh, in what you're offering to the U.S. Sure. Well, when we looked at, uh, we, we talk to our customers every day, we do lots of research, and the number one category of um, programming that our customers were telling us we were lacking in, and they didn't have to tell us because you had to look at the service yeah, to know that, yeah. that we were lacking in, it was films. And so, you know, we, we really looked at that as an opportunity to really take a big step forward in our film offering. We have the Criterion Collection, and we have some smaller... Uh, output deals that we have to fill in around it. But I think we're going to be a little more aggressive over time in terms of increasing the level of films and the volume of films that we have. Um, we think it's important. You know, it's a, it's, a big, it's a big category, and if you're in an SVOD service, you have to have both TV and films. Yeah, well, we're very thankful for that. Anyway, thank you very much, everybody, and have a great MIPCOM, great. and uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, outside. Great, thank you. Thanks.